Hi, my name is Diana Chavez. Thank you for joining our webinar. Sunray secures $10 billion annually for GCs, subs, and suppliers. We're a national construction document service. Today's webinar is conducted by the wonderful Andrew Nissen, an Oregon construction lean law expert. Today's webinar topic is a contractor's, subcontractor's, and supplier's step-by-step -step guide to getting paid. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the fabulous Andrew Nissen. Thanks, Diana. Um, my name is Andrew Nissen. I work at Aldrich Goldstein here in Portland, Oregon. Been here since 2014. We do a mix of general construction law uh, for owners, developers, contractors, and subs. Uh, I started my career actually in 2009 uh, defending generals and developers in construction defect actions. Um, and then switch over here where, like I said, we do more of a mix of traditional construction law. Uh, so today I want to go over uh, some of the basics uh, on getting paid. Um, nothing that I say today is legal advice. It's just intended to provide a general overview. So consult an attorney for uh, your specific situation. Um, First thing I want to go over is the construction contract. Um, big commercial projects, there's almost always a contract. A lot of times on smaller residential projects, uh, the contract ends up being just the contractor's bid uh, that's signed by the owner. And that can work if you have um, terms and conditions that are part of your bid. But you know there really are some basic elements that you need to have and that are important to have to preserve your lien rights. So let's go over just a couple of those. Um, first thing you need is the parties. You need to know the ownership and the entity names. That gives you um, an idea of who has the authority to make and execute decisions. Um, again, you'd be surprised sometimes the party names aren't on the contract. Uh, it helps to have a description of the project, um, the address, and then the owner information can become important for preserving your lien rights if you're not contracting directly with the owner. So for example, if you are contracting with a tenant in a commercial space, you need to know who actually owns the building uh, if you end up putting a lien on that property. Um, other basics, price and payment terms. Um, again, I have seen contracts where you can't really tell uh, what the price is for the work and uh, what the payment terms are. So it's important that you have an agreement on how much you're going to get paid and how that's going to work. Uh, some typical types of uh, payment terms are a fixed price contract, certain scope of work for a certain price, that's it. Uh, or you can do cost plus structure, uh, which also people will refer to as TNM, time and materials. Uh, and that can be with or without what's called the GMP, uh, guaranteed maximum price. Um, it's important to have the payment terms outlined so you know when you're getting paid, what you need to do uh, in order to get paid. Sometimes if you're dealing with uh, especially a large commercial owner, uh, their lenders will have all kinds of requirements. So you need to know what those are in advance. Uh, there are also such things as <clears throat> if you're a subcontractor, you can have what's called a pay if paid provision, meaning uh, the general is trying to disclaim its obligation to pay you if it doesn't get paid by the owner. Now that may be uh, legal in Oregon. It's kind of an undecided area. Um, more likely any provision like that is actually going to be converted into what's called a pay when paid provision. So if the uh, owner's payment to the general contractor is late, the general contractor may have an excuse for paying you late as well. Um, and of course, when we're representing a subcontractor, we try to avoid those types of situations. Um, and you have certain rights under Oregon's uh, Prompt Pay Act that if it applies to your project can be a powerful tool. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. It's also important to have a schedule in your contract. You need to know when uh, the project is supposed to start, what the um, definitions are going to be for when it's substantially complete, when it's finally complete, um, if there's an architect involved, is the architect going to decide when substantial and final completion occur, or is that going to be up to the owner? Um, it, it's good to put all these things in the contract if you can. Uh, another item is, of course, 
what the remedies are going to be if there are delays that are not your fault. Um, are you going to get uh, the option to have time and money coming your way? Is it going to be uh, just an extension of time or is there you know, no, no damages for delay? Uh, some contractors um, <clears throat> end up signing no damages for a delay clause and then you have to fight about whether they're entitled to any additional funds when the project is held up and it's not their fault. <clears throat> and then finally, of course, you want to have the scope of work outlined in your contract. Um, it's important not only to have the scope, to also understand the different terms and conditions that might apply to your contract. You could have a very clearly defined scope. Uh, particularly, this, this can come up in a, in a subcontract for a large commercial project. The scope is nice and clear. We're just, just doing drywall work. But then if you look in the terms and conditions, maybe there's some uh, design assist role that, that is mandated that uh, the subcontractor wasn't expecting to do. So there's a problem that comes up and suddenly they're roped into hiring an engineer uh, to help uh, design a certain aspect of how their work attaches to the project. And that's not something that they had uh, planned on in their bid. So you definitely want to know all of the elements that are in your contract. Um, let's go over some basics for securing your lien rights. <clears throat> I won't go over all of all of these right here, but basically, the what is a construction lien? It's a security interest in real property. So, if you're a contractor that provides labor, materials, equipment, or professional services, like an architect or a designer, um, you may have lien rights as long as it's a private construction project. And, Ultimately, the remedy could be a forced judicial sale of the property. So uh, the courts take these pretty seriously. They want to make sure that all your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted before you potentially have that remedy. Now, it rarely comes to that. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you can file a lien and get paid right away. Sometimes as a subcontractor, you file a lien and the general contractor uh, provides a bond, basically attaches that lien to the bond itself. So that's what you're um, actually going to be foreclosing on. But um, it is potentially very serious that you could be taking somebody's property from them to satisfy a debt. And so that's why, uh, like I said, the lien laws are strictly construed and things like notice to all the affected parties and timing are critical to preserving your lien rights. So again, depends on the type of project, but you can only file a lien on a private construction project you can't lien government land um, or a government entity. <clears throat> That's why they have uh, bond claims that we'll talk about in a little bit. But sometimes something that people overlook is that even if um, a project is on government land, so think of a hotel that's built um, on public land on maybe an airport uh, facility, but the hotel is actually privately owned, you may be able to lien that hotel or you may be able to uh, lien the interest uh, that the private owner has uh, in that property. So don't overlook that all is not lost if you are working on like a hotel or a port uh, facility, something like that. There may be an interest that is lienable. Um, <clears throat> the lien laws talk about, uh, they don't use the phrase general contractor, they call it an original contractor. And that is the that is the person that contracts directly with the owner. Uh, the subcontractor is the person that contracts with an original contractor. And then the supplier, of course, provides materials that are actually incorporated into the, pro into the project. All of those people may have lien rights. To make sure that you're set up to actually be able to uh, file and enforce a lien, you need to be licensed, bonded, and insured with the Oregon CCB. If your license, uh, if you don't have a license or if it lapses, you can uh, lose your lien rights. So it's important to keep those things uh, in place throughout the duration of the project. Um, you also need to have a contract that meets Oregon's requirements. Um, those are available on the Oregon CCB website. Um, you just Google Oregon uh, CCB contract requirements. Uh, there's a nice little list that they've set out there. But here are some basics. The contract, if it's for work more than $2,000, needs to be in writing. It needs to include basic party information and it needs to include your CCB license number um, actually on the contract itself or 
and the attachments to it. Um, and then, like I said, there are some other items that we've covered before. You want to keep your basic project info on there, the scope of work, the payment terms, and then the signatures uh, showing that, that both parties agree to the contract. Um, you also want to send your pre-lien notices when required. So in general, uh, this is more applicable to a residential project. If you're uh, an original contractor on a residential project, you have a packet of notices that you actually need to send. So there's three of them, a uh, consumer protection notice, a notice of procedure, and an information notice to owner about liens. And again, this is on the Oregon CCB website. Those notices actually need to be delivered um, at the time of the contract. Um, if you're a subcontractor on a residential project, you need to provide what's called a notice of right to lien, and that also applies to a supplier as well. Different requirements for commercial projects, um, original contractors don't need to provide the notice of right to lien, and for most of those projects, a subcontractor doesn't either. Um, they figure these are our big kids and they know they know about liens. Um, it doesn't hurt, that said, it doesn't hurt to send the notice of right to lien. Uh, I've dealt with larger commercial projects where our subcontractor client provided a notice of right to lien. It didn't hurt anything. So uh, if you're in doubt, I would say go ahead and send it. Um, so like I said, can't lien public projects. You may have bond rights, though, for public projects. Uh, just a brief overview. Um, Oregon and federal laws require the prime contractors to furnish a payment bond, and that secures the payment rights of suppliers and subs. Uh, if it is a federal project, you're going to be under something called the Miller Act, uh, which came about in the 1930s, and it's, like I said, a way to uh, ensure that um, lower tier contractors and suppliers on the project get paid. The Federal Miller Act protects the first and second tier subs and suppliers, um, and it's for contracts over $100,000. If you have a claim, you've got to give notice within 90 days after the, late, the last day that you perform labor or supplied material. Um, when we go into Oregon here, um, this, every state, as far as I know, has something called the Little Miller Act, and these are individual acts that each state has um, that are uh, the same idea as the, the Federal Miller Act, but each state has its own requirements. So in Oregon, right now, if it's a contract over $100,000, you may be able to access the general contractor's bond on the project. Um, and you've got 180 days from the last date that you performed work uh, or supplied material in order to file your claim. So these are things you definitely want to see an attorney about. There are offices that specialize in doing claims just like this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about rules and exceptions for liens and bonds. Um, Pre-lien notice requirements, we just talked about those. You've got a residential construction notice package that's uh, required for residential projects. Um, the three notices are listed here. If you're a subcontractor um, or a supplier, you want to provide that notice of right to lien on a residential project. The interesting thing about those is they, they are backwards looking. So if you provide that notice um, on uh, within eight days of starting work or delivering materials, it protects uh, basically eight days back. So if you've been working on a project uh, for a week and you provide your notice, the work that you've done up to that point and going forward is, is protected. Um, at least you provided, you have the ability to file a lien on it. Uh, but if you've been working on a project for 16 days and you say, shoot, we forgot to send our notice of right to lien, well then your first eight days um, is actually not gonna be lienable because you didn't provide the notice. Um, so that's why I tell people, if in doubt, go ahead and send it. Um, and it, the form that's required uh, by the statute actually says on there, it, this is not a lien. It's just uh, preserving your right to lien. So um, next thing to be aware of here is uh, your lien filing requirements. And this is where um, 
the timing element really comes in. And sometimes people will come to us and they're lean, you know, they're on day 75 and we've got to file it right away. Or they had a situation where they went through lean service and the lien was filed, you know, on day on day 75. And then we've got some work to do to make sure that the lien rights um, that we may have some arguments to deal with on the other side uh, where they will say, well, no, it's actually, uh, you know, this lien was late. So my theory is you file it well before the 75 days is up so that you don't give the other side that that question or that ability um, you know to fight rather than just pay um, paying a legitimate lien. So <clears throat> um, most liens now are recorded electronically. There are different national services that you can record the lien. However, uh, the county still has to acknowledge it. And so uh, county offices tend to shut down at five, sometimes before. So you want to get that electronic filing in uh, early in the day. It can take five minutes for the county to acknowledge it. Sometimes it can take a couple of hours for them to acknowledge it. So what you don't want to be is on day 75, filing a lien at the last minute and the county doesn't acknowledge it until the next morning. You know, that may kind of make or break your lien rights. So when does the 75 days run? Uh, in Oregon, it's a little bit different than some other states, but it's basically 75 days after you cease to provide labor, equipment, or materials, or 75 days after the completion of construction, whichever is earlier. So this is something you definitely, um, you know, that's why I'm saying you want to get in early within that 75 days, so you're not depending on, well, was it the last day that uh, I was on the project, or was the project completed at the same time? Um, you don't want to be in that situation. Uh, completion of construction basically means the project is substantially complete or there's a completion notice that has been posted. There's a whole uh, legal process for that or the improvement itself, the project has actually been abandoned. That's a more recent requirement because people were wondering, well, if the project is never completed, you know, how, how do people get paid on their liens? So there is a, um, a way to show legally the project has been abandoned. Um, basic level of what the lien must contain. Uh, you need to provide what's called a true statement of demand after deducting all credits and offsets. You also have to include, of course, the owner, the person that you contracted with, a description of the property, which is going to be uh, the address if you know it, and then the legal description if you can get that. Sometimes people will actually attach a map and just circle the property and, and put an arrow pointing to it. That's kind of an additional uh, safeguard of, okay, this is the project that's being leaned. And then the um, claim has to be verified by somebody uh, who has knowledge of the facts. It doesn't need to be somebody that was actually um, on the ground in the project. It can be somebody that works in the office. They need to have knowledge of the facts. Typically, it's not going to be the person, uh, it's not going to be your attorney or the other, the lien service that's providing the lien. Um, they're not going to be able to sign it for you because they don't have knowledge of the facts. So, um, and that also needs to be notarized. Good thing is there are electronic notaries available now, so it's not as much of a pain as it used to be. Uh, we had to actually go to a notary. Um, you can do that online now. Here's a sample, a true statement of demand. Um, where you put in what the contract price is, what the change orders are, uh, the total value of the work, and then uh, subtract how much you've been paid, and that's your that's your lien amount. And then typically, what I would do here is um, attach further detail, um, and you break it down between labor materials, equipment, and services. Basically, the person receiving the lien needs to be able to ask basic questions and find out, you know, what is this lien based on. Um, within 20 days after filing the lien, you need to mail a notice of lien filing. Um, that, you know, continues to protect your lien rights. Um, and then not less than 10 days before you file the actual foreclosure lawsuit, you have to provide notice of intent to foreclose. So um, what a lot of people do is they actually combine this into uh, one notice that provides notice that the lien was filed and notice we intend to foreclose. That goes to the property owner. Um, if there's a, a tenant involved, goes to them. 
You can copy the general contractor uh, if you're a subcontractor, and, and then you want to copy the mortgage holders. So like a construction lender that's on the property, uh, you need to give them notice of the lien too. Um, as far as timing goes for bond rules, um, you need to file your claim uh, within 90 days of the last day that you perform work, like I said, um, and you'll have to bring a lawsuit within uh, one year in U.S. District Court, so that's in federal court. Um, as far as an Oregon State project for bond claims, uh, you have to give your written notice within 180 days, and then you need to bring your suit in Oregon State Court uh, actually within two years. It's possible that you could end up in federal court. Um, Again, your attorney would be able to help you make that decision if there's a, a like an independent reason to be in federal court, but generally you're going to file um, in Oregon State Court. One thing um, that I just want to briefly mention that people don't always think of as a source of payment is an Oregon CCB bond claim. So if you're a subcontractor that's not getting paid on a project, the general contractor is going to have bond requirements. And depending on what kind of project that is, what type of contractor and endorsement they have, it could be a $10,000 bond up to a $75,000 bond. So as a sub or as a supplier, there are ways to be able to make a claim against that bond to, to get paid. Generally, that's um, for a sub or supplier, it's going to be within one year of when the general contractor, uh, quote, incurred the indebtedness. So uh, that's basically when, when you did the work. So if you're within that one year period, you may have the ability to file a CCB complaint. So the CCB has its own set of rules. It's not in court. Um, you have to file a claim according to whether it's a residential project or a commercial project. Uh, you have to provide notices of your claim. So work with your attorney there. But it is a source of payment that people don't think about all the time. Um, and we've we've actually used it successfully uh, to recover some funds on you know, a project that's kind of gone bad for everybody. There's at least some funds there that can help reimburse a subcontractor. So just something to be aware of. Um, let's say, uh, or let's see, lean law traps to avoid here. Um, you don't want to waive your lien rights in the contract preemptively. Um, some states clearly allow it. Oregon may allow you to kind of preemptively waive your lien rights. Um, I would definitely not recommend that. Don't give up your lien rights in advance. Um, when the owner needs a, a, a lien waiver, you can do that, um, as we'll talk about later, to the extent of payment. Um, and that should satisfy any owner or any lender. Um, but I, you know, like I said, liens can be a powerful tool to, to get paid and, and you don't want to give that up preemptively. Um, also, the reason that you want to keep, uh, include uh, information about the uh, amounts that are due, kind of break it up into labor materials, uh, equipment and services is to avoid what's called a non-segregable lien. So if the owner can't ask simple questions and figure out what the lien is about, the court may say, well, you know, this isn't segregated between lienable items and non-lienable items, and so we've got to throw the whole thing out. That's pretty unlikely, um, but still, I would, I would avoid simply putting an amount uh, just an amount due and not including any information. Sometimes you have to do something very close to that if it's the last minute, <clears throat> but um, I would, like I said, include a breakdown if you can. Um, other items, you want to make sure that you have the right parties and that you've uh, provided the notices, you know, timely notices after you file that lien. You've got to deliver your notice of filing within 20 days. And like I said, combine your notice of intent to foreclose. You have to do that um, you know, at least 10 days before you file the foreclosure lawsuit itself. So best to do them both at once. And that's what most people do. Uh, another thing to know about to keep your right to attorney fees is to respond to requests for information. There's 
couple different places in the Oregon lien laws where the owner or the mortgagee, the bank, um, can send a request for information. If you don't respond within a certain time period, then you still have your lien, but you don't have the right to recover attorney fees if you win. So there's a pre-lien request, um, there's a 15-day timeline, and there's a statute here, I've referenced those, and there's also a post-lien request that's after the lien has actually been filed that you have to respond to within five days. And that's kind of a short one. Sometimes people will uh, send you that notice on a Friday, and then by the time you get it on Monday, um, you've already, you know, you're already a couple days in. So it's important to respond to that right away. And the response doesn't have to be super detailed. There are statutory requirements um, to meet, but uh, you know, ideally, you've got all this information together as part of preparing the lien, and you can just point uh, the sender of the notice to that, and then preserve your right to fees. Um, 75 days, like I said, that can be kind of a question in Oregon. Um, and again, it's the earlier of when you cease to provide labor equipment or materials or 75 days after completion of construction. So if you're repairing your own work, that doesn't extend the 75 days. If you're just performing punchless work after substantial completion, probably doesn't extend the 75 days. The only way where you've got a lien right that is potentially resurrected. Uh, there's a case that's somewhat recent where a, a contractor performed work on a project and then a few months later came back at the owner's direction and performed some change order work under the same contract. And it's very important that the change order reference that same contract. Um, the subcontractor hadn't been paid initially, still wasn't getting paid, filed a lien for all of their work. And the court said that was okay because um, they were performing that work under the same contract the entire time, even though there was basically a break of their of a couple months um, during their work. Because it, that contract just continued, uh, the court found that they could lean for all of that. So um, you definitely want to consult an attorney and be careful with that one, but I think it is something that's important to know. Um, that if you're you know, continuing to do additional non-trivial work under the same contract, your, your lien rights can be uh, extended that way. Okay, right way to exchange your release for a check. Um, and I put it, you know, basically you wanna do it to the extent of payment. So an owner, when they're paying you, they wanna make sure that um, the work is done right and that it's been Timely completed, and that once they issue payment, that's it. There's not going to be any complaints. Um, and also, they're not going to have to pay twice for the same work. So, um, Oregon law requires an original contractor to indemnify the owner from uh, lower tier claims to, you know, for exactly that reason to stop, prevent someone from paying twice for the same work. Uh, but still, that uh, idea is out there, and, you know, owners want to want to cut off that risk as much as they can. Contractors, on the other hand, of course, want to get paid and preserve their pending and potential claims as much as they can. Uh, another consideration for the general is they want to make sure that the subs and suppliers won't lean the project uh, once they get paid as well. So they, they share at least two common goals, get paid and preserve pending and potential claims to the extent that you can. So, you know, all this is a long way of saying that you want your release um, to the extent of payment instead of a broad release of all claims as of the following date. You know, there are some contracts where the owner is going to insist on that type of language. You need to work with your counsel to you know, modify it to have something that's, that's acceptable for you. Um, but when it comes down to it, a lot of people um, will you know, they'll agree that, look, if there's a claim that we know about, that's fair, let's go ahead and list it. We'll list it on the release and say that, you know, we're, we're releasing claims except for these, you know, five outstanding change orders that, you know, we have a dispute on, but we're at least saying you're not going to waive your rights to that. And then finally, pay attention to what's actually written on the check. Uh, this is more of an old school saying that sometimes people will write payment in full on the check, even though it's just a progress payment or something to the effect of the endorsee you know, waives any and all claims. 
on every check. Best to not have that language on there so that you don't have to fight about, you know, what you were actually owed, whether additional amounts are owed. Um, so like I said, while these tactics are arguably not effective, you want to watch out for that on the check and then um, you know, work with the owner or through an attorney to strike or modify this language so that it makes sense because ultimately you want you want the contract to be fair for both parties and, and the payment terms to be fair. If there's a dispute or an outstanding claim, then it should be noted and, and you shouldn't be giving up your rights to uh, a disputed claim uh, when you've got something that's undisputed, everybody agrees on that's what this payment is for, then you should be able to get that payment and then move forward with the project. Um, so at this time, I think I'll turn it back over to Diana to see if there are any questions. Hi, thank you so much, Andrew. That was a wonderful, wonderful webinar and uh, so much information for sure. Uh, yes, um, one of the questions is, can I collect the entire unpaid amount from the property owner if they have already paid the general contractor in full? Um, so that's going to depend on your specific situation. Uh, but I would say you can still go ahead and lean. And like I said, there there is a, an Oregon statute that requires the general basically to indemnify the owner. So if the general has received that money, there are ways to go after them. What you may end up doing, assuming you follow all of the um, procedures to, uh, to maintain your lien rights and then you actually get to the foreclosure phase where you're suing, you're gonna end up naming both the owner of the property and probably your general contractor that got the money. And then like I said, you know, work with an attorney based on your specific situation. Um, and that, uh, that's sometimes where that ends up going is there are a lot of parties that, that get named in the lawsuit until you can kind of sort out, okay, well, who got the money? Where is it now? And then of course, how do I get access to it? All right. The other one is how long is my lien effective on a commercial project? So on a, a commercial or a residential project, you need to do what's called, uh, or closing on the lien, which is filing the lawsuit within 120 days. So you've got within 75 days to actually file the lien to get it recorded with the county. And then after that, you've got 120 days to foreclose on it. So the foreclosure, that's the lawsuit. Um, when you actually uh, file the lawsuit, it will usually have uh, foreclosure on the lien. It will sometimes have a breach of contract claim it may have other claims like what's called an equitable claim. Uh, one of those is, is a, it's called quantum Maryland, which basically means as much as it's worth. And it's saying like, you know, court, we had a contract here, but if you don't find that there was a contract, then, you know, we're, we're entitled to the reasonable value of our work. So that's a claim that sometimes gets disputed, but you know, many attorneys put that in there along with the lien foreclosure claim and the breach of contract claim. Uh, just various theories on how to get paid, but your you know your first deadline is within 120 days of of the lien. So great. If anyone does think that a question was not addressed, feel free to reach out, and we'll be sure to answer any other questions. Could you please go to the next slide? Okay. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. No pop quiz. Um, if the project cost exceeds $2,000, when does a general contractor need to send an Oregon information notice to owner on a residential project? Do you want me to go ahead and uh, read the answer, Diana? Oh, uh, no, no, I mean, yes, you could do it. We just wanna do the second question and see if they can type it in and uh, whoever answers the question correctly, then we will send a gift and then just give them a time to, to type in if there is anybody typing. But let's go to the second question, see what they... Okay, know. question two, when is the deadline to file a claim of construction lien in Oregon? All right, so okay. what would be the answer for the first question? First question would be D, at the time of the contract. Uh, so that's part of that uh, three, three document packet that you get from the Oregon CCB all needs to be at the time of the contract. Mm -hmm. And for the second one? And the second one would be B, 75 days. And this says last furnishing, but as we 
uh, review, there's a couple of different uh, triggers to that 75 days. So you know, definitely consult with professionals as to when the 75 days runs. Great, great, thank you. And uh, whoever answered the question correctly, we will send a little prize later on. Now, could you please go to the next slide? All right. So uh, here are um, some of the Sunray, Sunray resources to help you get, you know, organized, uh, know your deadlines, secure your lien rights. You can scan the QR code to access those resources. And if you could please go to the next slide. You can check out our new service that Sunray is uh, offering, the receivables. So you can go to our website, sunraycollections.com. And go to the next slide, please. There we go. This is for our next webinar. Is don't sign a release unless it says this one thing. It's on Thursday, September 12th at 1.30 p.m. as well. And you can register at sunraynotice.com slash education. And of course, we would truly appreciate if you could leave us a, a Google review. Uh, go ahead and scan that QR code. Uh, we'd appreciate any input 